frustration, they express their anger, um, their rage at the way that African Americans have been treated by police officers throughout the country for a long, long time. And I think that the best thing I could do is just to listen. And people, I think they felt better just making sure that somebody was hearing them. And I think we, we, uh, we convinced them that, that we had heard them and that we're gonna try to be very responsive to their concerns. Yes, Mayor, what was your reaction to the uh, tragic murder of George Floyd? Well, I th it was uh, the revulsion that I felt, I think was shared by a surprising number of people. We know, we know that people who are most uh, affected were in the African American community, but I have to tell you that uh, almost everybody I know was f found it repugnant. They were so upset by it. And I've heard from countless police officers to say the same exact thing, that they would never tolerate that uh, among their, their brothers in blue. They would just never do it. They would never stand there and have somebody essentially murdered in their eyes and not say a, and not say a word. So uh, yeah, it was very, very upsetting to me, my family, my friends, but also to the police officers in the city. Yes, um, how, as far as that, um with the murder of George Floyd, obviously people were outraged and uh, angry and they went out to protest and there have been riots, uh, looting. What do you think will be the answer to finding out wh why and how we can change uh, African Americans it being treated the way that we are? Yeah, it's, it's a very great good question. It's, it's a great question, question and it's a question that has it's been the essence of the question that we've discussed for two days in the countless meetings we've had to discuss this and my you know my my caution to everyone is you're looking for you're looking for a solution to a problem this is a problem that has taken hundreds of years to develop we're not going to solve it overnight we have to make incremental but but confident steps in improving relations and improving opportunities I always talk about the city, my objective for the city is for it to be a just city. And a just city is a term of art used by uh, a Harvard professor who is an uh, expert in African American studies. And a just city to me is a, just, is a place where equal opportunity is available to all, that prosperity is available to all, that good housing is available to all, that the parks on this side of the street are as good as the parks on that side. Mm -hmm that the, the facilities here are every bit as good as the facilities elsewhere. And you know, uh, this is just a long, long strategy to get there. It's a long, hard fight, but it's something that's gotta be top of mind and we've gotta be conscious of it all the time. Um, we, have to, we have to fight today for our children tomorrow is, what I, is the way I see it. This is not gonna turn, it's not gonna become a perfect world overnight no matter how hard we try. For those who just tuned in, you're watching DETV. Um, I'm Stormy Norman, live on Community Crossfire. Um, haven't been on for a few years. We're on with the mayor of the city of Wilmington. We have people watching from Minnesota, my good friend, Gordon DeAnne's mayor, fraternity brothers, and Mike Walls, and a whole bunch of folks. My new co-host, um, my grandson, Jermaine, and I think his father's here, Jermaine. Yeah, he's Norm's here. here from New York, and his wife. We got Lynn Lappy watching. My baby there from Atlanta. A lot of people are watching this, Mayor. Man, let me ask you a question. I, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but you and I had this conversation. Mayor, you adopted a black and African-American child. And I know you don't like to talk <coughs> about that. And you and I talk about you have some of the same fears that some of the people in our community have. Um, do you want to talk about that? Or I know you don't like to engage in that. Well, but, it's but, personal. But, but, but it's, it's a reality there. Yeah, it's a reality, and it's a personal thing with me. I never want to. I never want to be talking about my son in a way that suggests that I get a special pass because right. I've got a black son. But I. Um, but the, the the only thing I would say that that I share with others is that when he goes out and wears a hoodie, I'm as concerned about him as any other father is about their kid. I appreciate when that he's about you him, so much. Yeah, I would just tell you that. It's no, 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 no. I appreciate that about you so much in our friendship, right? That you don't and you never have, but it's a reality. Yeah. Right? Am I right about that? Yeah. So you deal with some of the same fears that we have to deal with that you don't talk about.
Yeah, and it's uh, if you don't mind, it's just uh, I, I feel like it's I'm not just talking about me, but I'm talking about That's okay. about him, and and so I I can just tell you that that uh, it's real. It it's he he's um, he's no different than not, no different than your grandson. Let me ask you a question. Let's um, switch the subject for a second. Let's talk about the COVID nineteen, right? Yeah. How has that affected the way you're governing now in the city of Wilmington? Well, it's really, it's, it's almost crippling the government in some respects, and in another strange way, it's making it, it's making it better because everybody's got to work harder to make do with fewer people. We've got, you know, in the city county building, we've got half of our staff is, is at home for, uh, at, on, on leave, essentially. And so we don't have every, all hands aren't on deck, so we're, we're operating in a, in a more efficient way with fewer people. Right. The, um, but it's still, it makes it so much harder. You know, the, we had a meeting today with, with there 25 or 30 people around a lar in a large room. <clears throat> I was so happy to have a meeting that wasn't on Zoom, I can't tell you. <laughs> I was so thrilled to have live bodies in the room to talk to across, even though we all had our masks on right. and you could barely... Uh, hear us, but it was such a joy to kind of be near people, and because today all we do is everything is on that doggone Zoom. That when it's over, I hope we never use again. And, and we should invest it in the stocks, you know. Who knows? Well, that, you know. <laughs> Jermaine? yes, Mayor. Obviously, COVID nineteen has cost a lot of people their jobs, and f as far as for the city of Wilmington, how do you see your, yourself helping uh, create more jobs for the uh, community? Yeah, COVID-19 has created, um, gosh, is it 30, 30 some odd million, f close to 40 million people unemployed in this country, uh, the largest number of unemployed in the history, uh, uh, rec modern history, maybe, maybe ever. Uh, so it's a, it's a reality. It's frightening. So um, I know the federal government's going to kind of patch things up for a while, but they're going to have their limits, and before you know it, we're going to have people who just don't have any uh, auxiliary source of income, and then we really, we're going to really have a problem. So I think this gets back to what happens when the city county building is now um, half empty. You have to adjust and say, okay, what do we do now to help one another? How do we make the city work better? Well, I think this is a little bit of the same thing, and there's almost something appealing about it, and that is to, to try to face this challenge in a way that we bring everybody together who up who have up till now been operating um, a little inefficiently because they've got their own little concerns to worry about. They're not thinking about the bigger picture. If you say that people, people's livelihood is at stake, what are we going to do? That's, it just elevates, the, it elevates matters to a much higher level, and I think uh, all of us come together to try to solve these issues. I, uh, that doesn't solve the employment problem, it, it solves the, the need problem that people who are not employed have special needs. We have to come together and see that, that, that between the federal government, the state government, even city government and county government, that we cr create the infrastructure that people are taken care of. Now beyond that, I hope that we, as we climb out of this, that we basically adopt the same kind of mentality that they did after the Great Depression, which is we have to put people to work. And so, to me, this does two great things for us. A, it gets people to work and it lets them live. But secondly, is it takes people who haven't been in the workforce and finds them uh, an easy way to get into the workforce and try to create some rhythm in their lives. And I think that's really important for the health of our, of our society. Well, I, I, I want to tell you, me personally, I think you're doing an incredible job. I, I mean, I don't know, I mean, you didn't have layoffs, right? Did, did you have a, a, a tax hike? No. So how did you do that with this environment? <clears throat> so what happened was we came into office with $28 million in our cash, in what, what we call our, um, unfund, our, um, our fund balance, uh, our unassigned fund balance. This $28 million of which probably, of which about 16 or 17 was cash. Uh, after last year, after the last three and a half years of operating at a surplus, we had almost $52 million there. So we had, we had some reserve funds. We created a, uh, a tax stabilization fund. Uh, we also always have our budget reserve. So what's happened this year, we projected a $13 million loss, uh, which is a pretty big, out of a $170 million budget, 
13, that's almost 10% of it. So, um, so we cut about five and a half million dollars uh, in, in, in all the different departments, and then the other five million dollars we're going to take out of out of our cash balances. Uh, I think if we can get through the year at this kind of level where we're at a thirteen million dollar loss, we're going to be fine. And then I think what we want to do, and I've told everybody, we have to have a plan for two years because this could s stick around for two years. And we still have our budget reserve, and we have some other things that we can do to give us the flexibility to get through another year of this. After that, it's really going to be difficult for us. Yes, I would like to uh, switch gears back to the George Floyd situation. Um, there's an obvious disconnect between the minority community and the police force. Uh, what do you see as the need to close the gap between that? So, I, you know, it's funny. Let me challenge you. I think the the, the the gap is not just between the black community and the police force. I think what where we have to work together is to close the gap between what is um, not, a, not a monolithic white community, but generally white communities and black communities have got to spend much more time understanding one another. I think it's a terrible thing that uh, in our society we don't learn, we don't learn black history. So on the walls of the city county building, we put something like 40, 40 images of African American historical figures and quotes from them. And the sign that we have on there is American history, black history is American history. Because people don't understand, they really don't understand what, uh, what has been America's original sin since its founding. And if people believe that uh, the story of slavery is there was, there was slavery, they fought a civil war, it was over, and everything was okay after F Lincoln freed the slaves. That's a distortion of history. So I think that, that the thing that has to come together is not just police and, and black uh, community, but white community, black community. On top of that, our police department has got to be, have a culture, has a culture that would find repugnant what happened in, mm -hmm. in Minnesota. It, you can't be tolerant of small abuses it can't be like the television shows where the guys, the, uh, he can do whatever he wants to and everybody pats, you know, winks and pats him on the back for getting the confession. You can't have that kind of a department. And I will tell you that my police chief and the senior staffing that he has around him have transformed the culture of this department. And they I have. think that's going to go a long way to reaching the objectives you described. Let me give Dean TG and Ivan, Ivan and your staff and, and a shout out. I mean, to get the mayor here this evening, um, Jermaine. And, and I think that, I want, I want to ask you a question. Um, first of all, I always like getting interviews like with a mayor or somebody like that, right? What did you expect as mayor and what didn't you expect as mm. mayor? So uh, I think it's harder than I expected. You know, I, there's no question that you can't, you can't, you can't be prepared for mayor and, until you're here because it's uh, there's so many things coming at you. There's so many people who've got a different opinion about what you did <laughs> right today. I did half the people think I did a great job. Half the people think I was terrible. So th it's harder in that respect. The politics is exhausting, but I kind of think I kind of knew it. But I think all in all, it's a more difficult job. But the thing I didn't expect is how rewarding it was. I just don't think I ever understood. I never understood how important the job of mayor is to people's lives, from their day-to-day -day lives. Wow. And so to me, um, you have to understand, I get out of bed every morning. I never, ever say, gee, I'd like to take the day off. I really, I really enjoy what I do. I enjoy this challenge. I, the idea that we have a chance, I and my superb staff have a chance to change the city for the better uh, is more gratification than anybody could imagine. And frankly, at my age, I just don't have, I don't want to waste time. So you I look young, man. You look young. <laughs> I, I see you, you know I'm not young. <laughs> you know, speaking of your staff, let me give a few people, like John Rago, Tammy Washington, yeah. Charlotte Barnes. I, I, I love yeah, they're, they're wonderful. Wayne Jefferson, you know that's my guy. Wayne. Wayne <laughs> Sanderson. <laughs> Doing the work of the Lord, Kevin Kelly. I, I, I really do. I, th I think that overall your staff is doing crew. an incredible job. It's a good crew. Did you want to ask a question, Wayne? Because I was... 
No, I never. You know, so far, so yeah. I, you know, I got my phone, right? So I get Texas. So I got a friend in Minnesota, Golden D'Angelo, right? Remember Golden from here? Who's that? Golden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he's a fraternity brother of mine. He said, no, give me a shout. I was like, Golden, I said hi to you like 15 times. So we spent a whole uh, interview saying hi, Golden. So hi, Golden. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, man, um, are you guys prepared, as Jermaine was saying, for the next riot, not, or not riot, for March or whatever? Are you guys prepared? Because I, I got oh, the feeling. I, think I, got, I got the feeling. Prepared. Let me, full disclosure, I got the feeling <coughs> that they weren't prepared last night. No, you know, it's funny. I don't think that's exactly true. I think, I that's think what happened. That's why this is cross-mind. You got your opinion, I got mine. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I agree. So, but, I, but I would say it wasn't that they weren't prepared. I think that um, if, we had, if we had a local group of folks expressing their anger and their rage and behaving in a way that, I, you know, I, I hate to say mob, it sounds so pejorative, but I mean, if, you know, if when, when people get together, they start to get fired up, they kind of act like they have their own. And they call you all kinds of names. They, yeah, sure. But um, no, but what happened last night, these guys acted like they knew what they were doing. So, you know, the, the chief had his people deployed fine and they were walking with them, but then they split up. They split up into five different groups or six different groups. So now you've got to split up all of your folks. And, and at that time, it got a little tricky trying to keep on top of everybody. So he called in, he called in support from the, the state police and the, uh, and the county police. And I think, I think they, managed, uh, they managed it really pretty well. But you know, there, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing. And they did not want, they did not want to escalate They did a good job with that. They didn't want to escalate it. And so when it was all said and done, and I feel terrible for some of our retailers who got beat up on, on yeah. beat up meaning they really got they got terribly vandalized. Do you, think, do you think after that happened, any of them would leave the city? It wouldn't surprise me if someone oh. finally said, look, you know, enough's enough. I mean, I, I could see that happening. I, I would, it would break my heart. They're all really great, you know, long time folks. But, but I would, uh, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that, that we support them and that they'll stay. Thank you. Let me, um, let me ask you one more question before you leave. W one of the um, key things that your administration is doing dear to my heart is the money that you get to black students going to HBCU colleges. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that. Um, so I, I we really have, that effort. yeah, three years ago, uh, two of my staffers came to me and said, we have an idea for an HBCU event. And it was an HBCU college fair one day. And um, we did it at the Doubletree right next door. And we had, I, I think about seven or 800 kids showed up Mm. Maybe a little bit more. Now it was about 1,300 kids showed up. About seven, seven plus hundred were admitted to school that day on the spot. It was really a terrific day. Uh, exceeded all expectations. A year later, a year later, it was about double that amount. So we had another 14 or 1,500 kids who were admitted. There was three million dollars in scholarships given that day. Uh, many, many of those scholarships given by Dell State, your alma mater. And then, and so th during that year, we had, we contacted Stephen A. Smith to come up and speak at our banquet. He came, he was so impressed that this community was supporting our young HBCU uh, applicants in a way that he's not seen anywhere else. We had two senators, a governor, the mayor, everybody there to support them. And so he decided this year to come back at our third HBCU uh, week now and uh, bring his show from ESPN to the bo to the uh, 76ers uh, Fieldhouse, and uh, we had 3,500 kids show wow. up to apply. Uh, by the time it, the three years tallies up to over 3,000 kids being admitted, four m plus million dollars in scholarships. It's been it's been the best best thing that we've done in three and a half years. It's just outstanding and. So we're s worried about this year, of course, but we're going to try to we're going to try to pull it off somehow, some way. Got you. Well, on behalf of myself and my uh, grandson Jermaine, we thank you for coming out, especially because we had a long day. You've had a long last c um, couple of nights. We appreciate your honesty and your candor. We hope to get you back. Good seeing you, Norman. All right, Jermaine. ladies and gentlemen, hope you stay tuned to DTV. Um, I mean, this is going to be an incredible show. Um, we're, we're back. Give me a crossfire, right? Yeah. Bingo.
we and next we're going to have Pastor D, one of the guys who organized the rally that kind of went crazy in AWOL. And we're going to ask him why. Ask him how can he keep it under control. And Pastor D always has something to say. So, Ivan, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned, guys. And by the way, tell everybody to tune in. Channel 28. Give them a phone. I'm Tabita Aries, Christina Cultural Arts Center's School of the Arts Program Manager. CCAC offers fall and winter spring class sessions, which can be viewed on our customer portal. Just visit our website at ccacde.org. Be sure to stop in during our Art Loop on first Fridays for a happy hour networking mixers. Christina Cultural Arts Center, we're here for you. Second Chances Farm is kicking off today, an ambitious program to tackle childhood obesity and food deserts all at the same time. Our next door neighbor is Eastside Charter, and we plan on Friday, March 20th to kick off a 12-week program. We will deliver 200 community-supported agriculture, CSA packages of six different crops we grow here at 3030 Bower Street to 200 children and their families at Eastside Charter. Each one of those packages will contain six different things that are nutritious, and we'll rotate what is in there, and we'll have recipes and menus on how you can use this lovely food. Each package costs $20 a week. For 12 weeks, it's $240. And if you would like to support it, please go to our website, www.second, S-E-C-O-N-D, chances, C-H-A-N-C-E-S, farm.com. And there's a place where you can support uh, our community-supported agriculture, our CSA program. It's one way for $20 a week, you can make an impact on childhood obesity and food deserts in Wilmington. Hi, I'm Andre Jones, a drama teacher at Christina Cultural Arts Center. I teach acting through narrative design. What is that, you say? <laughs> well, it's learning how to be while imagining and writing it down. Essentially uh, experimenting with writing and acting simultaneously. The better you write, the richer the scene. The better you act, the better you can be. Be bold, be brilliant, be uh, original, be imaginative, be generous in giving, but whatever you do, be. Because if you don't be, who do? Come, be with us. Christina Cultural Arts. Inspire greatness. Crossfire and Another Point of View. I'm your host, Norman Oliver. Bingo. Joined by my co-host. Jermaine I, Anderson. I, I know I gotta give you like a, a cool name, like Super G or something like that. Like you can't we'll just work on it. We'll, we'll work, work on, on it for yeah. next year. Just gotta put some thought into it. So um, it's been an incredible 48 hours. It's been an incredible four days, right? Yes. And one of the guys who have been an organizer in our city and you know, I, I talked to a, a friend of mine, Jermaine. Right. Let me recall. He said, you know, sometimes people are rebel rousers. Right. But they get things done. And sometimes you got to overturn the apple cart, whatever right. it is. And so Pastor D is one of those guys. And I think that we're going to have people on this show like we used to. And we're going to be involved with politics. Right. Right? We're going to talk about controversial issues, right? Right. Because we want to. Yes. So we're not afraid to tackle anyone who comes on this show. And at some point, you guys are going to have to have us a, a telephone so we could take calls so the audience can engage with us. Because we're okay with that. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm ready for that. I think it's important that we get the audience in on the show and uh, get their take on it. Thank you. Pastor D, how you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm well. Norm, thank you for having me here. Uh, and thank you, grandson. It's, it's, it's nice to see the third, what's third generation of you. Maybe we can call him Little Thunderstorm or something. Thank you very much. <laughs> let's, see, let's, let's jump right into it, right? Why did you think it was important to organize the rally last night? I'm going to ask you a few questions, right? Okay. 
first let's put that in context. I heard your intro. Um, the rally and protest that I was one of the leaders of, not organizers, okay. was actually organized by <clears throat> three groups or, okay. or two groups and myself, that being the um, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, and the uh, Food Not Bombs group and myself and our uh, group. Now, the organization of it came about right there at Rodney Square. Uh, but your name stands out. We, my we, name stands we, we, out we can, because my name is known. We, we, but we can't ignore that point. Well, you don't have to. I'm, I'm not ashamed of anything that took place in your, um, in your um, lead-in. You said Pastor D's one of the organizers of the rally that went or the march that went bad. Right. That's not the truth. It Tell was an entirely truth. different march. Okay. It was an entirely different march. So would, what, 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 what would, at some point, you would agree, something would awry? At some point, that what went awry was designed to go awry. Okay. Uh, if you tell, look, tell at us, the, tell us why. look at the news in every city, Norm, right. every city where there's been a protest, there have been two protests. Absolutely. There have been the people outraged about the murder of the brother, uh, George, and there have been the people who riot and, 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 and burn buildings outside agitators lead them mm -hmm. another way. In our case, our uh, rally protest went from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Gotcha. That was black, white, short, tall, indifferent. It was 100% peaceful. Gotcha. Your own attorney general was there. City councilmen were there. Councilman Trippy Congo was beside me most of the time. We, we, we rallied, we spoke, we marched. When we left the front of the city county building, uh, about uh, 500 or so strong, as we came back to Rodney Square to disperse, we noticed another group that went up Market Street. Gotcha. We realized that some of the people in that group were people I and we had confronted back at our rally. There was a group, I believe, out of Philadelphia of men. None of them were from Wilmington. But they were organized. Tell, they, tell, they knew what they were tell, doing. Tell, tell me about those, that group. We talked about that group. I think you called them the black Israelites. I, I don't know if that's their tag or what have you. I'll just say it was a group of brothers that weren't from Wilmington, and they were all in uniform and what have you. And you could tell the difference between the people with them and the people from Wilmington. They came into the crowd. Their leadership came up, and they demanded the bullhorn. We were using a bullhorn. I had the bullhorn in my possession. They were yelling obscenities, F the police, let it burn, burn, baby, burn, right. eye for eye. Young people who were there catch up on that kind of energy. And when we dispersed and, and left, I had totally left downtown. What, what time was this? this? We left at 2 p.m. Uh -huh. At that time, these guys took and over. other took, so people they took, so not they took, from... They took over the March rally or whatever you want to call it, right? They hijacked the energy. They didn't take anything from us because we didn't allow them, but they hijacked our young. Norm, understand that our young people, they're fed up for a whole nother reason. I got you. And they're ready to tear up. But they have no leaders in the street. They have no leadership. So what they do is they, they look for the charismatic, loud person that seems to be saying what they want to hear, and they follow that person. Well, the agitators know that. They know that. So they come, just like they did in D.C., just like they did in Minneapolis and every other city, and they instigate that energy right. and lead them the wrong way. And, 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 and that's groups of different colors, right? Huh? That's white and black. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you mean the outside agitators? Yeah, right. They uh -huh. were different. It was one little white girl that was, man, so she cussed, she cussed like she oh, yeah. was making a, a, a rap record. And she was encouraging people. Uh, she encouraged, in fact, one little uh, African-American girl was with our group that jumped up on a police car. She got on the <laughs> car, and other people started coming, and she was punching. Trippy Congo and myself cleared a whole corner by ourself. Why? Because the kids knew us. Right. They listened to us. And if there were more people down there and faces that they recognized, they probably wouldn't, wouldn't have went with that other group 
and, and it might not have morphed into Jamil, Jamil. last night. Jamil, you had a question? Black people have been marching for decades for their rights. Um, it could be marching, it could be rioting, it could be looting. What's the next step to change how black people are being treated in America? You're asking me every, um, and, and young man, thank you for your question. I think it's a good question. Uh, I have to stop, rewind, play back to, your, your, back to your grandfather's words. He said, well, Pastor D, gravel rouser. One of the things is we have to respect and appreciate every component of the Civil Rights March. Uh, activism is a noble profession. That's right. We, we, we need activists. They do some of the things Norm talked about. That's right. But when we view them as agitators and rabble rousers, and then we communicate that to your generation, way. then we don't necessarily get the best they have because we create wounds. Now, what we do from here is that energy you saw last night with your generation, with those young people, right. is still unharnessed. All they did was last night was cry out for leadership. They're poor, they're jobless, they're angry, they're frustrated, and they're right there on the east side, west side. So all you grandmoms and grandpops, those <laughs> were your children down there last night. They were your grandchildren. And what we do is we go get them. We don't wait for them to come to us. But when we go get them, we need to have program, one, some type of housed therapeutic process for the ones already in the lifestyle, two, a buy-in to a very dynamic uh, program or platform, if you will, that gets them into lawful living. The teenagers of Dr. King's day studied the Constitution. They understood lawful living. Our generations of this day, they're not into the political body like that, so they don't have a, a, a constitutional mindset, and I'm my brother's keeper, etc. We got to pour that into them the way gangster rap pours the, the boot guns and bullets into them. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me keep you, let me keep you over here, right? So at some point, right, how did a peaceful rally get to not I-95, stopping traffic, get to Market Street and looting, right? Two reasons, and I think Dr. King said it best. When good men sit down, evil men stand up. Um, all over the state, there are frustrated, angry people, young and old. They're not mad at the cops, and I think we're being narrow when we think that this is about only the cops. Right. It's about the institutionalized unfairness. In other words, we're not just afraid of the cop who gets caught and doesn't get punished while he murders somebody on TV. What about the bad cop that people complain about year after year, beating up folks' kids, taking their jewelry, and this kind of thing, and nothing is ever done about him? who comes back into community and teases. So it's the institution that, 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 that approves of seemingly or that allows bad people to continue to do bad things to people. And what you saw were people on the east side, people on the west side, people on the hilltop that decided, well, since the powder keg is exploding, today is the day that I'm going to express my rage. So it's very easy to make that happen again if there were recognizable personalities mm -hmm. of people they respect. Right. So we can't stay back when we see them. We got to go out there and say, hey, little starter pistol, I'm your grandmama's pastor. Right. I'll tell your grandma. We got to go out there, and when they see us and they know us, then they will respond, and we can got. But if not, the agitator will come in from Chester, Philly, somewhere else, and tell them, burn, baby, burn. Let me ask you another question. So you know this is Community Crossfire. We ask tough questions. Come on, and Crossfire. We, and we don't care about engaging in any kind of dialogue because we're here for the long run, right? Yeah. Yes. So what is your frustration, right, not only with the African-American community but because you're a pastor, what is your frustration with the reverence of pastors of this city and this country? Because you're activists. Ooh. My, yeah, woo, woo. My, frust <laughs> my frustration with the pastors is many fold, and I'm, I'm a pastor myself. I love pastors. Right. I love pastors. I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for a pastor, Pastor Aaron or Moore. So I love pastors. 
I love Bishop Weeks. But, but my grievance is there is no clergy, brotherhood, unity, wow. alliance in Wilmington. Wow. It's a game. We're like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There's a group over here. There's a group over there. And everybody is really uh, uh, fighting for a spot in the limelight or, or, or some federal dollars or to be patted on the head by a political official. But if the preachers Talk about would it. roll by the code uh, uh, that we are supposed to be living by for the people, for the people, if we did that, we would have a greater unity. You got pastors in their pulpit bad-mouthing me. <laughs> you got pastors in their pulpit bad-mouthing Hanifa Shabbat, bad-mouthing. We don't do that. That's not what preachers do. We don't, we don't uh, teach our people to go around disliking people. We heal and help people. We're not jealous because Pastor D gets some press. That's, that's really what, what, why some of them now, most pastors for the most part, show me love. But the reason we can't organize is because we get behind the door. Ah, oh, you don't want him here. Oh, you don't want that one. And as long as the pastors don't roll by the I am my brother's keeper's rule, they're not going to have any power. The kids don't respect the pastors because the pastors don't respect one another. My man, good. You got a question? Yes, how do you think the president has handled the murder of George Floyd and the protest that Pastor comes behind D, it? we got two minutes for you. Well, Mr. That. Trump, poorly. I'll just say like that, poorly. Mr. Trump handles everything like this poorly, but he celebrates it because you know what? The climate that you saw last night was created by the rhetoric of our president of our president. A couple of the white uh, uh, protesters that, that were hollering burn baby burn earlier had mega hats. Exactly. Hello? And, and, and you can't tell me that they were there to defend the rights of African American men. Yes. They were there to create a situation. Yes. Down in Dover there's a group of a clan, a radical group of young clan members who are, who are calling for a race war up here toward <laughs> yeah. Claymont. They got some skinheads. You know what I mean? They talking about they go have they ready for the race war. They won't come on the east side, west side with that stuff. <laughs> but they round. So so that whole climate. Do you think, do you, um, I don't know when we got a minute, but real quickly, do you think some of those folks are coming into some of the rallies and inciting it all? Oh, they definitely are in the rallies. They are oh, yes. definitely there. I, I heard that at the rallies. I'm telling you, this guy actually tried to tussle with me to take a bullhorn, but it was too many young brothers from Wilmington <laughs> that said, nah, you don't want to do that. That's nasty. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that's why we have to come together. When our kids see what goes on in city council, and they look to us to be their leaders, and they see us cut each other's head off, sarcastically disrespect each other, and sabotage each other, the kids say, man, I'd rather be in the gang. Least we got love for one another. My boy that gave me the dope, least he loved me for real. <laughs> He'll die with me. They look at us, talking about life in the American way, and we don't even like each other. Well, well I'll tell you this. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can see we're back live. And once we get, I'm going to bring you back, because, you know, I, I like this kind of format. You know, I we like kind of get yeah. loose. Jermaine, who's our next guest? Angelis Gilmore. Is that Pastor Angelis Gilmore? And she was one of the organizers? Evangelist, Evangelist uh, uh, Gilmore? Deborah Gilmore spoke, uh, several women spoke yesterday, and she was one of the women who spoke for the women and the mothers of grandma. Matter of fact, she stood up to one of the rabble-rousers from out of town. Gotcha. Uh, he tried to take the microphone from her. So again, our rally was peaceful, it, it was orderly, and we left at 2 p.m. Maybe you shouldn't have left. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have, Norm, but my children... You shouldn't start something leaving. Maybe, didn't leave no, it I didn't chaos. start that. I didn't start that. You, we you ended. was a part of the rally we at the beginning ended. and you left. Norm, I left to go find you to what, see what why you, you were going to meet me down there, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're enjoying Community Crossfire. This is what we do. And we're back. We're going to get Channel 28 back rocking and rolling. Ivan, we, we're rolling. The break? Thank you, man. Good job. I like him. What, what I'm Tabita Aries, Christina Cultural Arts Center's School of the Arts Program Manager. CCAC offers fall and winter spring class sessions, which can be viewed on our customer portal. 
just visit our website at ccacde.org. Be sure to stop in during our Art Loop on first Fridays for a happy hour networking mixers. Christina Cultural Arts Center, we're here for you. Second Chances Farm is kicking off today, an ambitious program to tackle childhood obesity and food deserts all at the same time. Our next door neighbor is Eastside Charter, and we plan on Friday, March 20th to kick off a 12-week program. We will deliver 200 community-supported agriculture, CSA packages of six different crops we grow here at 3030 Bower Street to 200 children and their families at Eastside Charter. Each one of those packages will contain six different things that are nutritious, and we'll rotate what is in there, and we'll have recipes and menus on how you can use this lovely food. Each package costs $20 a week. For 12 weeks, it's $240. And if you would like to support it, please go to our website, www.second, S-E-C-O-N-D, chances, C-H-A-N-C-E-S, farm.com and there's a place where you can support uh, our community supported agriculture, our CSA program. It's one way for $20 a week, you can make an impact on childhood obesity and food deserts in Wilmington. Hi, I'm Andre Jones, a drama teacher at Christina Cultural Arts Center. I teach acting through narrative design. What is that you say? <laughs> well, it's learning how to be while imagining and writing it down. Essentially uh, experimenting with writing and acting simultaneously. The better you write, the richer the scene. The better you act, the better you can be. Be bold, be brilliant, be uh, original, be imaginative. Be generous in giving, but whatever you do, be. Because if you don't be, who do? Come, be with us. Christina Cultural Arts. Inspire greatness. Welcome back to Community Cross Find Another Point of View. So I'm going to tell you, right, on this show, we fire folks up. We're not afraid to ask the tough questions. Yes. Um, and I'm glad to have my grandson. I'm glad to have Jermaine yeah. here. I'm glad that my son's in town, Norman, and little Jermaine, and uh, his, your, your, your mother. Yes. Why don't you give him a shout out? And Mike Rawls in Golden in Minnesota, and my baby Lynn in Atlanta, and her kids. Everybody's starting to watch this around right. the country again, right? Yes. Um, and we don't let people off the hook. At all. So I have no idea why Pastor D brought this young lady in. Right. But she says she's ready for community crossfire. You think she's ready, Jermaine? I think she's ready. Let's, let's no, ask her some you, tough you, questions. No, you, you, you throw it at her. Uh, yeah, so... Um, so is I Evangelist I Gilmore? Yes. What's your first name? Deborah. Deborah. okay. Yes, okay, so welcome to the show. Um, as far as Derek Shaver, the officer that has been charged with third-degree murder uh, on... George Floyd, do you think he was charged appropriately? Good question. No, I, so, I, so when he asked the question, you answer? Like this is a give and take? <laughs> Ask the question again. Yes, do you think Derek Shaver was charged appropriately? No. And, and why? Why not? Okay, let's try this again. We ask the question and you answer the question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, okay, so, Jermaine, ask the question again, right? Maybe we need to go slow, right, in slow motion. Yes, yes, slow Evangelist motion. Gilmore. <laughs> uh, officer got charged with third-degree murder. Do you agree or not agree, and why? That's a good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm teasing you, by the way. I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> Because you come on here like, I'm ready. And we've, we've been on here for five minutes and you haven't said anything. No, I disagree. I don't think the charges was appropriate. Um, 
because he is an officer, and officers are out to protect each other. They're to, to protect us. They don't have a right to do harm to us and then get a slap on the wrist and say, oh, well, I still got my job, I get suspended with pay, and we just keep it moving. No, because if it was his family and someone had done it to his family, guess what? We want the top rate. There you go. There you go. Now top rate. Now, you, now, you, now you're the sister. What, what exactly is evangelist? I'm evangelist. I'm an um, outreach ministry. I go out and encourage people to come to Christ. I help people. I'm a people person. Um, I so, so like evangelists, do you like get people into church? Do you like um, pray over them? Do you like? Um, it depends on what the situation is. I, I mean, I'm just trying to. I do up. lay hands on people if needed. I do pray for people. So, were you needed. laying hands on people yesterday? No, no. Why not? It wasn't necessary. It wasn't that kind of event. People were looting. What are you talking about? It wasn't that it, they wasn't looting? What well, well, was your definition? Beginning. It wasn't looting. You can you can beginning. look at the picture. You can look at the we were you can look at the camera and, and all that. Look, and all. it was peaceful in the beginning. Okay. It started off real smooth. It stayed real smooth the whole time. People were protesting. People were hollering out. But see, you got to be able to listen. Okay. You got to be able to listen to uh, to understand what people are saying. We got people that are hurting in all kinds of ways besides uh, talking about a police officer. Right. Come on now. We got, we, got, we got people up there in the government. We got the congressmen. They're pushing us under the bus. We're not getting exactly what we're asking for because they're not really listening to us. Now you're getting fired up. They're not listening <laughs> to us. Up. So we're not getting what we need. We've been settling. Talk about it. We've been humbly, lovely, patient, settling, and nobody wants to hear us. Talk about Everything it. that goes forward that we ask for, we don't get. What are some of the things you're asking for? Stop building parking lots. Okay. Stop tearing down the houses, building parking lots, put the homeless people off the street, get, put them in one of them empty houses. Give them an opportunity to build it for a year uh -huh. and see what, they, and then turn it over if they make a success out of it. Open up some mental institutions. Look, Thank you me. got mental health running rapid in our city. Talk about it. Where's the buildings? We Talk. close down the Boys and Girls <laughs> Club. We take away from the young youth. Yeah. What happens? We got the older ones, that's, they go in and out. Now they're afraid to come outside. Afraid to come. They ain't got no life. I'm afraid to come outside. They're afraid to come outside. Okay. You got a question? Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going at you. Man. Yeah, you so you're you're you're, you're on the peaceful protest side. People have been protesting for years. Obviously, that hasn't been doing anything because black men are still getting shot in America. Do you think looting and rioting is going to have to be the answer? Looting is not the solution. If you follow through, um, in the 60s, I was a little girl in the march. Which march? Uh -oh. I was in the march to march the city hall for our rights. Okay. I was a little girl. And then what they did, the same thing happened. People start burning up stores. and Why are you burning up the stores in the business? So you're against that then? I'm against that. Yes, I am. You know why? Because when your baby needs a pair of sneakers and you ain't got no bus fare and no car, how do you get your baby a pair of sneakers? That's, that's, you, that's, that's, that's if my baby's alive. And you tearing down the store. That's right. That's if my kid's alive. A exactly. But you're tearing down the stores now. No, hold on. They're killing us. And then they were taking sneakers out of there, so they got their kids sneakers. Uh, no, they got them to sell. How, how do you know that? We in poverty time. How do you know? Oh, Jobs no. are lessened. People are not getting paid. They're not at work. So their son or daughter needs a size seven. They go in there and get a size seven. Some may get a pair of sneakers. The other might sell the sneakers. Come on, do we talk about reality? This is the real world. The real world is they got the size seven to give to their child. And they gave it to their child. That's my point. What about if the child wears a size seven and they bring a six? What if they don't? They need it. So exactly. some of the some of the looting, right? It's they, beneficial. What? Now you're on my side. What are you talking about? It's beneficial. I know I would get you robbed, you robbed the hair store? Why? What the hair do <laughs> My baby need brain. I can't afford it. So, so what are you going to organize? When, when is the next march? Do you know? No, I don't know exactly what the next march is, but I'm hoping 
that the next march will be more positive where we may be able to go to the legislation board or we may be able to um take out and get um what you call them what the um uh, uh what a loan no where people can petition oh petition the petition. Guy. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question because uh, we—I'm we, glad we woke you up because you was over there like nine a little bit. So the mayor was here earlier, right? Mm -hmm. What would you ask the mayor if he was sitting next to you? How can he benefit us at this time? Okay. How can he assist us on what we need? Okay. Is he affordable to really listen to us and open up some doors for us? Gotcha. Are you going to be on our side, or are you just going to be a lip service? Is, is, is your main issue is mental health and stop building parking lots and building houses? No. Good paying jobs. Okay. Such as? Whatever. Give my a raise. Give my raise. Give who a raise? The people. We need a job. We need I mean, a the people who are working for the city? No, the, not the people working for the city. Uh -huh. You can take some of that money back as far as I'm concerned. So, so you talking about just the common folks, like give, common, give, them, give, them, give them jobs. Give, make jobs available. Okay. Yeah, hold on. I, I would like to add, a, add to that. You keep on saying peaceful protest multiple times. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It has not been ha People have been uh, peacefully protesting for years. Before I was, be before I was before, uh, born, before um, Stormin was born, there has to be something else. And I think looting and rioting is, what's gonna ha is what it's gonna have to take. Uh, the officer shot uh, George Floyd for allegedly forged a uh, $20 bill. You, you gotta match violence with violence, don't you? No, you don't do violence with violence. That is not the answer. That's what Malcolm X said, or something That's to that effect. That's not the answer. Why would you do violence with violence and then everybody's on the same term and everybody loses out? Now, it might take some violence to start off for to make the people listen to us. Mm -hmm. Now, it might start like it just it just started. Now, are they going to listen to us? Because there's a skill into listening. And can they come together and give us what we need? And then we got to look at can the black people come together and work together? Thank you, evangelist. You understand? Because I'm not going to blame it all on society. We got to take some blame, too. Because okay. even though we've been doing stuff positive and working with everything, we still ain't learned how to come together as one to work together. Talk about it. And we can link up together. Uh-huh. And we can force them together. We can get something done. We are some powerful people. And we can sit back and settle and do it this way, do it that way. Change that, change that mess. Thank you so very much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I'm glad we woke you up, too. Look at you. You ready? Now you ready to get fired up. Look, look how you're sitting. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you. So, as you can see, we're back, Community Crossfire, um, another point of view. Now, we're going to have some, si you know, this is a political season, too, yes. Jermaine. So, we're going to have candidates coming on who's running for office. Right. We're going to have officers, you know, from the governor on down, right. U.S. senators on down. Right. Um, and also community folks. I mean, one of my favorite guys is Calvin Brown when he comes on here because we have Republicans and Democrats. So we're not afraid to ask the good questions and the hard questions. So thank you. And I think for your first show, I think you did an incredible job. Yeah, I liked were, it. Were you, I appreciate it. Were you pretty it. cool? Yeah, it was fun. Oh, wow. was it, I mean, is it something we should do different next time? Uh, I think we should get the audience into it. Yeah, I like that, right? Yeah. Have the phones ringing. Yeah. And, and that, that was one of our mainstays. So Ivan, so ladies and gentlemen, did you want to say something in closing, um, Evangelist? Yeah. Thank you so very much for coming on the show, um, and I will be at your next rally. I, I thought um, Keith James, the guy, um, he was at a meeting today. He said that he wanted to come down. I guess they, they, he couldn't make it, so some other folks are coming down. Okay, let's, let's have him on the show next time. Got you. And congratulations again. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed um, Community Cross by Another Point of View. This is our first show back in, like, shoot, three, four years. Um, people have been asking me when we're going to come back on, on the air, so we're back. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're going to uh, break. And Ivan, thank you so very much for having us um, doing it back on the show. Thank the evangelists. Thank you very much. Thank Pastor D and thank the mayor for being our guest. And closing, Jermaine, you want to close us out? Uh, yes. Thank you guys for watching our show today. We'll be back with more and have a good day. I think I'm